shocking things. You know, one of the most shocking things in the whole Exodus narrative that you almost never, ever hear many religious folks, um, um, many even Jews or Torah observant Jews, but, but some do kind of go into these things. They study the, the scripture a little more diligently. They study the scripture like you could say those old time Christians or Nazarenes, like the early Christians and, and, and certain ones in certain places that really study. Even in this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, world system, 400 years, if you just do a, a survey of how um, Christian, even European or white, or a lot of them wasn't all white, but Christians from England and Europe, parts of Europe, they would get into the Hebrew and the Greek and the Latin and, you know, look at textual, like, you know, critique. When I say critique, it's like looking at, okay, this came from, this is the Greek here, but this is how it's translated into Latin. And this is how some English translators translate it. Is this the right word? They would really get into things and then say, well, well maybe we have to go back to the Hebrew. So even a lot of the religious and bishops and pastors, they were more educated, you know, so they were able to kind of bring out a lot of interesting points that, you know, the church today, Christians and, and Messianic, Yeshua, Yahusha believers today are less concerned about that. You know, it's like Revelation, the book of Revelation, even the book of Revelation is a key thing. A lot of times when I'm speaking about Revelation, I don't want to say certain things that a person might think like I'm just like, it's not a personal critique. But it's something I've learned by maturing. It's, it's that maturity. It's like the Bible even say, grow in grace and the knowledge. Right? The knowledge both of the revealed word, the gospel, and also, which is the testimony of Yeshua, what we call the New Testament, and also the Old Testament, the scripture, gaining a knowledge of that. And what happened is that when this belief in Yeshua became less and less influenced by like Yehudi and Jews, you know, Nazarenes and others that believed, you know, like the apostles and Paul and even others. And when it got out of the linguistic point of reference, you know, in other words, even the Greek, reading the Greek and not having a point of view from a he remember it was the Hebrews who communicated things in Greek just like nowadays a lot of pro-black pro-African and comedic people majority wise they still speak English everything is English the majority of things is English and I'm not saying that that means that what they're saying is invalid but it's the same ones when they critique like the Bible or Bible believers that would say that what the biblical so-called Bible believers believe right is 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 not valid because look you're talking about you black hebrew or israelite and look the new testament is greek what they don't know is that the original that was was hebrew that basically was he not even aramaic aramaic that's the popular myth that goes around you hear some people say oh jesus spoke aramaic because they basically have drunk the kool-aid did he speak any Aramaic? Of course, because once you understand the Shem Afro African Shemitic languages, you under, you know, it's like it's like somebody who knows Spanish, like somebody know a form of um um um. It's like Hispanic speakers can understand some things in in Spanish, but not quite as accurate. And Spanish speakers might be able to understand what some of the Hispanic speakers, speaking about over here in the different Spanish-speaking countries, but even that Spanish compared to Spanish in Spain. But then if you know Latin, you can understand a lot of links between a lot of the Romance, the Latin languages. You see, so that's something that we don't really know today because we all only know English and everything. But um, the whole thing about the priesthood, yeah, the priesthood, whether the priesthood came out of the Levitical priesthood, whether it came out of Egypt. See, that's a, it's almost like a trick question on a certain level, because how do you understand that particular, you know, that particular question? The Levitical priesthood. So the Levitical priesthood is what? The Levitical priesthood is Aaron and his sons. Right. And it's called Levitical because the tribe of Levi was chosen after certain incidences that were recorded in Exodus. Did they come out? Well, yes, they did. 
did they come out as priests? Here's what most ones don't understand. I don't, I don't even know if, um, what's her name? Um, the two, the two black women that are going to debate, um, Nepal, Shada and um, um, Christina Nick, whether they're going to distinguish this or any of them going to distinguish that they were priests that were not Levitical. So many of the Israelites, I used to say the Hebrews, you know, Hebrews spirituality, not ethnicity in that sense. And Israelite is that family relation. So there were a lot of ones who were Hebrews in the sense of Aperiu, Aperiu, who some confound with Haberu, but there is etymological links. Because if you know how the Hebrew has a lot of puns in certain words, there's a word that means this, but now that's the meaning of it. But even if you look at it in the, the pun or the a Hebrew idiom, the other meaning kind of can bring out the, the forward meaning. So there's a front meaning and then there is a secondary truth. It's almost like how you hear ones taking, you know, say the lamb and the sacrifice of lamb. And then when they say, well, Yeshua, he is the lamb, right? How these two were seen, you know what I mean? To be a kind of a oneness, even though the whole quote human sacrifice was not ordained in that sense. Like the human sacrifice that they were to offer human beings. But the idea of sacrifice that one would sacrifice, in other words, that, that we sacrifice, even saying like, I've sacrificed my time to, to be able to teach and to share, you know, with my people. So that's not a literal sacrifice in the Hebrew uh, um, Levitical sense. But we can understand the relation to words. So when somebody says, you know, you know how much I've sacrificed for this, I've sacrificed for you, I've sacrificed for that. It's not literally. We shouldn't imagine that when they say that, that means they, they practice the Hebrew or some ancient, you know, um, rite. You know, of, of, you know, they took some animal and they cut the blood and, and, and you know, I mean, they cut the, 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 the neck of the animal and, and took the blood and then sprinkled the blood and then, then burned the fat over here and then poured out the rest of the blood over there. And they, and they said this and they did that and they had to wait on these priests or those priests. Like, for example, I wonder whether the point that all of the priests, the Levitical priests, are sons of Aaron, but not all of the Levites are priests. How often do ones kind of confound those two things right there? You know, where ones would think that when they say Leviticus and talk about the priests and you read about the Levites, many people think the Levites are the priests. Right? But the Levites are not the priests. The Levites right are the tribe that set themselves apart and they've been set apart to yahuwah and his sanctuary but the ones who will perform the priest's rites be anointed this is the key be anointed perform the priest's rites they according to what we have in in torah they would be of aaron of the descendancy of aaron so in other words as you said before aaron was the first messiah aaron was the first christ so forth and so on. Another thing is that there were priests, right? Let me just come out of here for a moment. There were priests, right, before who were not Levitical of the Israelites, right? And did the did did they practice um did they practice certain Egyptian things? The the the, the Israelites, the children of Israel? Of course. But of course they did. So were the Israelites influenced in any way by ancient um, Semitawi, Semitawi or ancient Mitzrayim? Of course they were. Of course they were. I mean, it's like, aren't you influenced by America? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, black people, we say we Africans, but how many speak an African language? I mean, those are just the easy points right there. You know, how many speak some African language? You know, or... or even if we go further, worship an African God. Or even if you are so-called into one of the so-called Abrahamic faiths, do you practice it the way so-called Africans who are also into that Abrahamic faith practice it? I'm talking about those who practice it. With Christianity, put the Christianity on the side for a moment. I'm more looking at like, like those who are 
like the Lemba or those who are Hebrews or Israelites, you know what I mean? Um, or those who are even the Mohammedans or the, the Muslim ones, like in Mali, Sangha, Songhai, and Senegal, you know, those civilizations there, because even many ones who came to America, you know, were writing Arabic. And one thing I recognize about some of the Africans back like in Timbuktu and some of those doc, they had some great libraries. A lot of that might have been destroyed. But one thing I notice is, is an attention to detail. It's like when you talk about Bilal. Bilal was the um, one who was with Mohammed. He was a Kushite or Ethiopian or some might say a Habashan, uh, Abyssinian in the latter Arabic kind of perspective of it. And he was the one who called the Adhan, the call to prayer. Like when you hear the La ilaha, you know, uh, Allahu Akbar, you know, you hear them, you know, the Adhan, the Adhan, the call to prayer. And it was said that he had a, a, a beautiful voice. You know, some of the stereotypes about black people kind of come in in this racist world that because he's a black man, an Ethiopian, you know, Kush, and Kush in his older sense relate to Negro, he had a beautiful voice and he could sing. You know what I mean? But in further study, it was said that not only could he sing, but Mohammed favored him because somehow he knew his speaking of the language was more perfect like the angels. See, a lot of that is kind of hidden over <laughs> and everything. You know what I mean? You know, it's kind of hidden over, you know, why they make a big point. So it wasn't even Muhammad that really called him to prayer so much, but it was, you know, Bilal, you know, the Ethiopian. So they were priests who came out, there were ones who was functioning as priests before the Exodus. We have it in Genesis. In Genesis, it's mentioned. And there was a priesthood that was connected with Joseph, right? That, that ones don't know. There's a priesthood connected with Joseph. And what Joseph was said to have done in Genesis led to the Hebrews as having a priestly kind of status under the old um, Sutanet, Sutan Bet under the old Parao, Per A A, under the old Pharaoh, the Pharaonic system interpreted is like is like the dynasty under the old dynasty, right? Before the so-called driving out of the of the Hyksos, who was not the Israelites, but they were a somewhat related Afro-Shemitic people. We're actually looking at more. We see the Hyksos, the mix-up of Esau. Esau was Esau, right? Um, but, but that being the case, there were priests and every firstborn male, right, of a family could serve as priests. So I'm not too sure whether these points are going to be illuminated on, but they are vital point. You know, when ones talk about whether the um, Levitical, Levitical priesthood out of Egypt, as people say, Kemet, in, in strong quotes, because really that is not the context there, according to the time. I mean, it probably was, they knew of the Kemet at that time too, speaking about, you know, um, the black land, and that referred to the Kush, the Kush, the Kui land. That referred to one of the vital necessities for their life, and that was the rich um, farmland the rich agricultural, the black, brownish, reddish, brownish, black land that came from Ethiopia. You know what I mean? So we can say, did did Kemet come from Ethiopia? <laughs> did Kemet come from Ethiopia? Somebody remind me of that one right there. We have some slides and additional information to go into that. Literally, directly, it did. But on the point of the Levitical priesthood, there's a couple of points that um, if anyone checked this out or if any of them check it out, that maybe not in this debate, whatever the debate, you know, is that they're going to have, how it's going to actually, Nepal Shada, she's going to be defending that more or less that, yes, that that Kemet, Kemet or the Samatawi, Samatawi had a strong influence, you know, on the Hebrew you know, Levitical, on the Levitical order, right? And I would agree with her in principle on that, but it's opposite than the way that most people would think because they say Moses was learned in all of the um, the wisdoms, 
in the Hebrew sense, the wisdoms. He was learned in all the wisdoms, you know, of the Egypts, like the upper and lower Egypt. Thus, his Ethiopian and DNI Kush connection, you know, both in um, Judaic, one might say legend, you know, and certain oral tradition. And also in certain ar archaeological finds that were found in Ethiopia that I haven't heard m most comedics talk about. They found this, there was some statue that's like an Egyptian kind of design, a comedic design, and it was labeled Musa and other kind of connections that kind of back up what the Torah speaks about in Median and actually connects Median and the Negev, the Negev, the southern lands, even deeper south, right, to either Lower Kush, Meroe, or Upper Kush, what we call Ethiopia today. So every firstborn male of Yasharala of Yisrael, up until the giving of the Ten Words, right, and in particular, right, until the after the molten calf incident, even up to the giving of the ten words, he still says he, he's his, his aim, Yahweh's aim was that Yisrael might be a nation of the priesthood, right? A nation of the priesthood. And there were those who were priests outside of the Levitical. There was those who function, and my point is that every firstborn male of the family, of a particular family, right, could offer sacrifices. So all men them, especially those who are like firstborn, who had that status of being like the one who's in charge, to whom more is given, more is required, was the one that would offer sacrifices like Abraham, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the narrative does. But you'll notice that Abraham offers sacrifice, Isaac offers sacrifice, Jacob offers sacrifice, right? But then after they go down to Mitzrayim, right, we don't hear about this overtly until we get to the period of the Exodus, until we're coming to that period of the Exodus, right? And as we're coming to that period of the Exodus, let me just bring this up right here because we, we, we want to like to share this right here, just to touch on a few quick points right here. When we come to the period of the Exodus, because we want to like to go back to that other presentation. When we get to the period of the Exodus, let me bring this up right here, right? Yeah, when we get to the period of the Exodus, we know there's priests, but Levi has not been, according to Torah, selected until the molten calf incident. Falsely called. Remember who says, who keeps running the falsely call golden calf is a theological idea, but it's not even there in the translation. It's not there. It's molten. It's called molten calf. And when we understand what does molten mean, right? Yes, there was some gold. They, 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 he, he did tell them to bring gold, right? Right? But when you read in the Hebrew, it had gold and the way it was made, it was made to bling bling, but it wasn't really gold gold. What, what, it, what it was, it was molten. It was a molten, right? And, and that's a whole reasonment there. So we have um, princes coming out of Egypt. Now, these princes were also priests. I'm saying priests because every firstborn male in the ancient time, every like firstborn or whether they were literally the firstborn or they became the firstborn by merit as we get, you know, the like the Jacob Esau kind of just use that as a point of reference. Um not just could, but had the responsibility to offer sacrifice for his personal family and if he was the head of a clan, for his clan. This was a part of, you know, this was a part of, you know, the order, you know what I mean? The order of things when they came out of Mitzrayim until the molten calf. And when the molten calf incident happened, when Moses came down and he said, who's on Yahweh's side? The only ones who could speak up, right? You know, like, 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 like when people are guilty, it kind of, like they say, the cat got your mouth, so to speak. They, the, the rest of them couldn't, it, could, it was only the Levites that spoke up.
And then from the narrative after that, you get to see this exclusivity now being given to the tribe of Levi. Now, according to the narrative, that's how it transferred from every rank and file Israelite, right? Or really every man of his family, right, could sacrifice. If he was the man that was the chief man of his clan, then he was sacrificed for the clan. He was both like the, the, the king, the ruler, you know, as well as, as the, um, the priest, you know what I mean? This is almost like when we look at ancient Mitzrayim, look at the king type and, you know, in some ways. It's almost like what Akhenaten was kind of striving for, except in the Egyptian, the Per A'a and the Smatawi system, it had already been um, um, separated into like guilds and to, 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 to orders, as it were. Now, did that influence the Hebrews or the Israelites? Perhaps. Mm -hmm. It did. But the biggest thing is influence is the opposite of what people think. A lot of what is in the Torah, especially Leviticus and elsewhere in the five books, at least to say the five books, as one say, the five books, let's say the Octatech, the eight books, including Joshua, Judges and Ruth as the Beta Israel of Ethiopia and the ancient church. You still got eight books, but everything else. Right is basically, or, or, or the legislation that they was given is a reaction to. It's almost like when y'all were there, y'all used to do this. Even the whole Paisa rite and ritual, the fact that they were to eat flat bread or unleavened bread was speaking to, was based on what they experienced in the Tawi called the Mitzrayim in the Hebrew, the two lands, AKA in ancient Egypt, so-called Kemet, what they experienced there. Because in ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, it was the, the flatbread, right? That flatbread was like the bread of the poor. It was like the poor man's bread. You know, a lot of people don't recognize. It was like the poor man's bread in ancient Mitzrayim, right? You know, the, the flatbread. While the loaf of bread was also used for commodity. And see, a lot of these things were already like kind of written in the Torah, Right? It was already written in the Torah and it was already kind of like, you know, been there. But now with archaeology, I'm seeing a lot of things that they're discovering from their studying ancient Samatawi, Mitzrayim, the two lands, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. And they are speaking these things based on their research and translations of, you know, so-called hieroglyphical or ancient glyphs, ancient writing and understanding they beginning to recognize, oh yeah, it was a dough, you, the, you know, the, the, the bread that was like a loaf, the loaf bread, that was the, the bread of the rich, right? And the flat bread, right, was the bread of the poor man because yeast was like seen almost like a delicacy. It's only like today, you know, if, if, <laughs> if somebody says, let me give you some matzah, right? You hungry, right? I'm gonna give you some matzah or I'm going to give you some nice fluffy dough bread, right? Most of you hungry a little bit too. You probably want the dough bread. You know, I remember back in the days how we would go around and we would look for the hero, the so-called hero, the Italian bread, because it's puffy, nice and puffy. You know what I mean? And even though it was like, you know, some people might say even empty calories on a certain level, it still can give you the feeling of fullness. So back in ancient Mitzrayim, it was all about like the bread, the bread and the, the beer. You know, in Rome, it was bread and circus, but in ancient Egypt, it was about the bread and the beer. That was like a main, kind of a mainstay. So was there influence? Yeah, there was an influence. Definitely there was influence. Did it originate? No. Did, they, the, did the, the, the Israelites pick up on certain things or adopt certain things or learn certain things from their according to the narrative from being there? Of course they did. But now the Levitical order and setup was a reaction against some of the practices that the people did in Mitzrayim, in the Smaitawi, in the two lands called Egypt, that according to Yahweh, Yahweh Eloheinu, according to Elohe Yisrael, we could say the Elohim of Yisrael, you know, or Yah, it was not according to his order. 
right? You know, not according to his order. Because let's look at the things like even the linen and the garments. A lot of this came straight out of Egypt too. What do you think? They went to the store somewhere? You know, like after they came out of Egypt, they would go to some store and buy some products come from an international kind of... Well, Egypt was international, but a lot of things that they got of course, was brought out. Even the gold that they used for the molten calf, it was gold that was brought out of Egypt. Now, was it Egypt's gold? That's another trick question. Because actually, Egypt, ancient Egypt, you know, they did a lot like a lot of other nations do today, you know, on a certain level, right? And they went into other lands, right? Sometimes, you know, by coercion, Right? By reasoning, persuasion, sometimes by force to get the natural resources they needed. They did this with the noob and Nubia all the time, right? according to the narrative. Right? And sometimes it had to be war because sometimes the Nubians were on the other beliefs than the reigning pharaohs. At other times, some of the Nubians, the Tarnessians and the Tarsetians, they were on the same level. As far as like religious worship, it's almost like if the if the Sutan Net Sutan Bet by analogy is a Catholic, right? And Catholicism has a lot of link in Christianity with ancient Egypt, at least in certain structural principles, right? But if the Sutan Net Sutan Bet, the the Melek of the Molek of Mitzrayim at the time of the witch come, if he was if he was a Catholic. Right, and the Nubians, the Tarnessian, Tarsetians, if at that time they were Protestant evangelicals, you know, how the Protestants were against the Catholics or against the Pope, the popery and the Pope system, then there probably would be war. But if at this time the 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 Nubians were under the same, you know, under Catholicism themselves, even if it wasn't straight strictly. Roman, you know, the, the, the Catholicism of ancient Egypt. I'm talking about how the religion helped, you know, when people believe in the same, like, trinities, right? Or the pseudo-trinities, as we, from our perfect, perfect perspective, we'll say pseudo-trinities, right? So, of course, there was a lot of, but was it like a slavish copying in that sense? Or is it that what we have in Leviticus is... Is 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 rites and rituals that we can find the ancient Sematawians and and Egyptians of that time period and before doing the exact same thing. Besides the basic rites of 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 you could say besides the basics, there's some basics of worship that were universal, right? And there were many other nations. Right, that did certain things similar, right, to what we can find in ancient Egypt. But as far as the Levites being a reflection of a particular order in ancient Egypt, right, as far as like an Egyptian or indigenous native order, no. What it was was more a reflection of a patriarchal order, right, that Yosef. Joseph, Joseph, he, he was able to bridge the gap. Remember, Joseph was one who he understood the principles, right? But then he is in a situation where, you know, he had to shave his face and, and he and, and, you know, his head and, you know, speak the language. And, you know, like Paul says, you know, be, be, be everything to everybody, so to speak. You know what I mean? To the Jew, he's this. To the, to the Hebrew, he's a Hebrew. But he's also a commit to you, to the commissions. And at certain other times, different times in ancient Mitzrayim, ancient Egyptian history, right? There was more religious freedoms. There were certain religious freedoms. It just so happens at the time we get up to the Exodus, right? That a lot of these so-called religious freedoms, right? That existed and was, how can we say it? Let's say it like this. The spiritual Sodom in Egypt, like America and the West, they talk about religious freedom, right? The right of religion and they say human rights or whatever, you know, people get the right of religion, right? Now, the separation of church and state, well, we can't really apply that to the ancient paradigm like they try to apply it today, right? Maybe a later period of ancient Mitzrayim, you know, maybe that comes in, but not from our studies. In other words, faith and religion and, and religious priest order you know, basically went together. 
So we're not going to dismiss that there was influence. Of course there was influence. They lived there for however many years, you know, but there was more influence with those who were priests, right? Saying that those Israelites who still function priestly roles and may have, and some did adopt certain commit to you, Smytawian, ancient Egyptian practices. I'm talking about specific, you know, you could say, um, netter, netteru, or netert, if it please, if they, you know, it could be God is God, God, whatever, worship. Yes, but the Levitical is something different, right? The Levitical is something different. In fact, this is the point that I wanted to share right here about the whole thing about the Exodus, right? Some points that people overlook. Point one again, right? At least this point as a point one is that all of the um, priests, Levitical priests, Levitical priests were Levites, but not all of the Levites were priests. Let's see if anybody brings that up during the debate or as this point is discussed on different platforms, if anybody brings that up. And then if anybody goes into any detail of why that is a significant factor. So after the molten calf incident, after the broken covenant was renewed. So we have a new covenant in the old covenant because once they broke the covenant with the molten calf, it was off. The people were like in a, a limbo, suspended, almost suspended movement, suspended animation. Moshe went back up there. He appealed. He came back down with a, with the second set of tablets, you know, told the people give a donation. Everybody was happy because they saw now you know, after Moshe came down, his face shone with horns and all of that, you know, that now that they were back in covenant and they gave so greatly towards the building of the sanctuary, you know, because the point of the molten calf, right, can show you where they began to return to, proverbially speaking, the vomit. After they came out and they were spit out of Egypt, some of them and after they came into the covenant, started to go back, right, to that worship when Moses didn't come down at the time they expected him, so forth and so on. So the whole molten calf incident is a primary incident of the influence of ancient Egypt on them. But from the point of view of the narrative, right, that is what brought forward the Levitical priesthood. Before the molten calf incident, let's see if we can just bring this up right here. Let's, let's go over here and bring this up just quickly. Just a, a couple of quick points right here. And hopefully if ones and ones want to get into a little more detail. All right, let's take this off of the Aleppo and let's go to the comparative right here. Give me one or the KJV. Take the, the Hebrew off of there. And let's go to nation, nation of... Let's see. Let's take. Let me clear that right there. Um, nation. Let's go nation. My nation. My nation. And go priesthood. Right. And it's important to understand the chronology of events because sometimes people do seek to make certain points. Right. Um, right. You know. Um, yeah. Yeah. One seek to make certain points, and they'll bounce around. Right. And some things would be, you know, would be lost. Right. Some things would get lost. If we put into chronology, then we can see how things develop. Here we, here we go. I was saying priesthood. So I had to remember that in the King James Version quote here in Exodus, Shemot, as is known as Sefer Shemot, from a Hebrew perspective, it's the book of names, Shemot. Right. The Exodus idea comes from the later Greek and other kind of versions, right? Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, but the book is also known as the Yetziah to Mimitzrayim. From a Hebrew perspective, it's known as the coming out from, from, from the two lands, but more directly is known as Shemot, the book of the names. And ye shall be, in chapter 19 is after the Exodus, says, and ye and y'all shall be to me a kingdom. Kingdom in the Hebrew is Mamlaka, one of the words here in the sense of a kingdom, a dominion, a sovereignty. The idea more better than we have um, um, uh, Malkut, right? We have Malkut, which is more kingdom in the sense of kingdom government. But we have Mamlaka here. You see Mamlaka, 
Mamlaka. Mamlaka is more sovereignty. Right? In other words, here's where Yisrael at Sinai, Har Sinai, accepted Yahweh's sovereignty, accepted um, Elohei Yisrael, the Elohim, or the nature, the nature of nature. So from a Hebrew perspective coming out of Egypt, we would refer to Yahuwah as the nature of natures, that he's like the God of gods. Right? So in that context, he'll be our nature, to use the, say, the commit to you. Right? But in the Hebrew sense, Elohim. Now, here you can see where it says kingdom, king's reign, and royal. So some might even say a royal priesthood. That's where we get the idea in the New Testament with Peter, where he talks about a royal priesthood. So he's going back to what was said after the Exodus. And y'all shall be to me a kingdom right, of priests, like a sovereignty, right, a, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. Goy Kadosh, a set apart nation. It says right after that in verse 6, Exodus 19 and 6, these are the words, the Debarim, right? These are the oracles, the words which thou shalt speak to the Bene Yisrael, to the sons of Israel. Now, some say, oh, son, what about the daughters? To whom more is given, more is required. There are instructions to the woman, but you know, mind them need more instruction. Don't you know? Right? So, this right here, is said right remember the exodus occurs right around like chapters you could say the chapters like chapter 15 we get the song of moses and everything right the chapters before is preparing for it so what we get to see in what yahweh and what is being directly conveyed by the narrative is a reaction is actually a reaction to the practices from the Hebrew or the Israelite or Yahweh's perspective that was wrong about what they was doing or that he would not approve in his worship. While they were there in Mitzrayim, right, they were more or less free. And while they were there, many of the Israelites performed their own priestly function because that was an ancient rite right, amongst the children of Israel and other related Hebrews, those in the same connective spirituality that they already practice. Now, in Egypt, it was a little different. In Egypt, there were set orders, right? There were certain set orders or ones entered into the priesthood, right? But in the Hebrew sense, right, or the Israelite sense, like many other, we say, African Shemitic people, the man of the family, the man of the, of the of the family, the household, the clan, he also did like a double duty as priests. Like we got Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. All of that would cease, right? Not here in Exodus 19 and 6, but more around as we get into Exodus like 30, 32. It's like the molten calf and then moving forward. And then we get the Levitical priesthood firmly being established around those same chapters when Moshe came down. Now, in closing right here, just on this point in closing right here, because I'm not going to make this really long, long, but a couple of points that we wanted to share, right? Because it's a very interesting question, ain't it? You know, did, did, would they, did they originate? No, a lot of practices that the Israelites were doing in the wilderness, we can say did originate, right? Especially a lot of practices like the golden calf thing. That basically was a direct, you know, doing what they were doing in Egypt. But that wasn't so much just a Levi. That was all of the men of Israel, of other tribes, could offer offerings and sacrifice. That's what the whole point is really in, in Leviticus, is that all y'all, if you're entering to this covenant, only, right, you know, only, um, only, let me get the three days right here, only going to Aaron and his sons, who will be the priests in this covenant, would be accepted. Anything else that one did, in other words, if a man wanted to sacrifice, he would take his sacrifice to Aaron and sons, the, the, the Levitical priests, right? If he were to do it any other way, that would be a violation of the covenant. So yet we have to understand how this must have looked to them, because before that, every male, like I'm a young man growing up, I see my father, my brother is giving sacrifice and offerings and doing it to, to the God. And now... We're in this covenant in the wilderness, 
And because of this molten calf, uh, that's a comedic incident right there, right? Sematawi incident. After, that's an influence there. Whenever we do see the influence, especially heavily, it, especially like in the molten calf, it almost created disaster, but it changed what Yah said a little bit earlier. He still wants it to be a kingdom of the priests. So the priests are going to be running it, but it's not going to be every male that's going to be able to be the priest. It's only going to be the Levitical priests and namely Aaron and his sons and his descendants. Now, one point that they often miss that the practice or the, the spirituality, the religion, as one might say, of the Hebrews, even in the Mitzrayim, was different than the Kamitiyu or the Smai Tawiyant, is this right here, for example. And they said, the God of the Hebrews have met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey. Did you know that the Exodus could have been avoided in the sense and all of the plagues and judgments and all that, it could have been avoided if the administration, the per a -a, per -a -a, the per on, par o, if the ruling administration, like the White House, the White Walls, right, par o, you know, not just speaking about the man, but his whole government, if they had said, all right, the, 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 the nature of the, the Hebrews, the Ibrahim, Ha Ibrahim, have met with y'all. Go ahead, go, 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 go three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to Yahuwah. This is what they ask. Eloheinu, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. This is what they first, look, what it, look where it's at. Exodus 5 and 3, early in the book, early in the book. We have to recognize why Exodus is different than, than Bereshi Genesis. It's because we get a change of administration, and this was a pivotal change, right, in the historical context of the nation of, of ancient Egypt, right, at this time. This is a whole new administration, and it seems as though this new administration, whether it's the Ahmose, we do point to the Ahmose after the Ahmose period, and the Tutmosides that came in, it targeted this group of people, right, in particular. We have that in the opening parts of the book. But when they first requested anything, they only requested for like a three-day vacation. Do you ever hear people talk about, oh, they came out, there was an Egypt, and they wanted to come out, and said, let my people go. They keep giving you kind of the latter-day Christian, like watered-down myth and everything instead of even giving you what the so-called mythos or what the narrative actually says. This is what they asked for. And what do we get in the next verse? And the king, the Melech, on this context, the Molech of Mitzrayim, said to them, Wherefore do ye, y'all, Moses and Aharon, let the people from their works? In other words, they were all about, like, you know, um, these social programs they were doing, you know, these public works. This is like one of the public, like in America, remember back in the 30s, they had the public works and all that kind of stuff after the Great Depression. This is kind of similar to what's going on in the historical context. So the king, right, the Sutanet, Sutanbet, Sutanbiti, he basically said to Moshe and Aharon, um, why are you all making the people like go from their works? Why are you loosening from the works? Get to your burdens. And then Paro, oh, then the administration, the great house, Par a, a said, Behold, the people of the land now are many, and you all make them rest from their burdens. The people of the land, that particular part of the delta, the Goshen, the Kushen, in which they were majority in, right? Paro oh, commanded the same day that the taskmasters of the people, there we get the Nagas. You see the Nagas? Right? The Nagas are there. The Nagas, the Noxin. The Nogsin, right, were some of the Kushitics that came down, right? The Nogsin, right? It's an interesting word that's there, and it does relate later on in the etymology to, to, to king, right? But these taskmasters, that's probably one of the reasons why Miriam, when, you know, she tried to blaze on Moshe and his Kushit, because many of them remember the Nogsin, the Nogsin, right, who in this sense were taskmasters, my taskmasters, there were type of lords, rulers, and later on in the Ethiopic, we would get this sense of like a king, you know, because a king basically does something similar. But these were more of the Cushitic taskmasters, 
All right, so some people, you know, like like figure like when we was in Babylon, your people were, you know, working for the government and everything and abusing us. So even though we all came out and obviously you left behind that role, you know, you still remember. Remember what you did to me back there? That's kind of what Miriam was on. So they basically commanded the same day the taskmaster, the people and their officers saying, y'all shall no more give my the people straw to make brick as hither to four. In other words, they were given the materials like you and you put it together, right? Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And that's where we get the idea of how the people started to cry, so forth and so on. The tail of the bricks which they make, there there to four, y'all shall lay upon them, y'all shall not diminish aught thereof. Right? Notice what it says in verse eight, for they be idle. You see what it says, but they be idle. Rafa, Rafa, right? They sink, they relax, right? Let drop. They're letting their hands drop. You know, they 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 are idle. They're abandoning. They're forsaken. They're showing themselves slack, right? Because they're talking about going on a religious, you know, so-called holiday. Notice they only said, let us go three days. How would it have been different if they grant them three days? And what we get to gather from the narrative is that other people, right, we're not being treated like the Bnei Yisrael, the Hebrews. And this is because of the form of the Hyksos, times of the Hyksos and the Hyksos incident that was just prior to where Exodus picks up, right? And it says, therefore they cry saying, let us go and sacrifice to our Elohim, to our, from the Egyptian point of view, our Netcher or Netcheru, if they looked at it like that, right? So notice what's going on. They only ask to go for three days, just three day vacation, a religious holiday, whatever, right? Let there be more work. Let their more work be laid upon the men. It's talking about the Bnei Yisrael, right? And the co-religionists and the spiritualists like the Hebrews that they may labor therein and let them not regard vain words. Right. Let the work be heavy. When they said let more work, literally, it's like let let the work be heavy, be laid upon them. Kabed, kabed, kabad, the word for gravity or heaviness. Right. Put more heaviness. And the taskmaster, the people went out in their offices and they spake to the people saying, thus saith. And then you get the you get the whole context there. One more point. Right, just to put this together right here with the next point we just want to share right here. There was a compromise. Right? This is gonna be hopefully the final point right here. We're gonna wrap up with this. Um, the compromise, so that we can hopefully go over and ones can, if they want to follow up on this, can look at the points that we're seeking to make right here, right? That um did the was the Levitical priest influenced by Kemet? Why did Kemet influence the Levitical priesthood? The more better question is whether Kemet or Sematawi, ancient Egypt, did influence why did influence the Israelites. A prime example is the whole molten calf incident. Why? And that is what that incident alone is what finalized, sealed up the priestly um privileges for all of Israel. In other words, Judahites could sacrifice, Benjamites, um, Gadites, Simeonites, all Naphtali, all of them could sacrifice before that, right? All the descendants of Yaik O, they did as their father did. Who he went, he didn't have to go through Levi, even though he had a prophecy. He did foresee what did come about. But even in his time, Jacob, Yisrael, he went and sacrificed. You read about it in Bereshi, Genesis. Isaac would make sacrifices. Um, Abraham makes they didn't, None of them had to go. Even when Melchizedek came along, he didn't have to go through Melchizedek to make a sacrifice. But what he did was give a tithe, give a tenth. He, he showed tribute, showed respect. So that means he must have recognized, you know, he must have recognized, you know, he must have recognized who, 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 who is who. Right. Let's go to this point right here. It's chapter eight. Chapter eight. We can scroll down here. The three days was a good choice because that actually leads to this particular this particular point right here. Three days journey. But we have to go back to verse twenty five. Right. So notice the three days journey. Does anybody talk about the three days journey? 
A more better question would be, why didn't Pharaoh, the Egyptians, according to the Hebrew narrative, why didn't he just allow them to go for three days? Because he probably thought they was going to run away. Right? And because of the previous Hyksos incidents, right? the previous Hyksos incidents, in other words, we maintain that the ones who are called the Hyksos were driven out at this time, but they looked side-eyed at the Hebrews because the Hebrews, ethnic, and even in some cases from an Egyptian perspective, religious, spiritual affiliation, right? And this verse here, these three verses will bring it out. Now, there was a contest with Pharaoh, with Moses and Aharon. This here is the first compromise, right? There were these compromises. In Exodus chapter 5, right, the contest with Pharaoh, that was the first demand, right? The first demand. The first demand, and that led to the increased burdens. They asked to go for three days. They said that the Elohim of ha Ibrim, right? ha Ibrim. Some people say there's no H. It's just an I. They don't know Hebrew. It's the Hebrews. ha Ibrim. Right, met with us, let us go. We pray the three days journey to the desert sacrifice to Yahweh Loheinu, lest he fall upon us with the pestilence and with the sword. That's what they said. And Paro and the Sutanet, Sutan Biti, they was like, yo, these people are lazy. They want to get a time to go on vacation. They want to go on vacation. Nah, give them more work. They got more to do. You know, they got time to even think about going on vacation, give them more work. Now, when we get over here to chapter 8, right, a lot goes on, so we're just scrolling ahead. Here we're at the fifth demand. We're at the fifth demand. Let's get this right here. The fifth demand, it was the fifth demand, right, contest with Paro, with the great house. And when the great house is speaking of church and state. With the king, the rulers, the nobility that was ruling the Tukmasides at that particular time, and with their particular priesthood, right? You know, with their particular, the ruling priesthood, the chosen priesthood that went with that particular dynasty, right? And here, the contest with Paro, the sixth miracle, the sixth miracle, the fourth judgment, right? Now, here, the, the fourth judgment is this right here, this verse here. Let's just read this. And Yahuwah did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the bite of Paro, into the great house, right? Into the house of the great house, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Mitzrayim. The land was corrupted by reason of the swarm, the swarm, right, of flies, right? According to the narrative here. Now, this here leads to these verses here, key verses here that you almost never hear those who, who promote the exodus or the narrative or those who try to critique the narrative. They always get to give you what you might have loosely heard in, in, in church or among Christians or in a Moses movie or something like that. The contest of Paro, the first compromise refused. This here is the first compromise in Exodus chapter 8, verse 25 to 27. Let's put it in context again. They sought to do what, right? They sought to go for three days and to worship with their God, with their nature. They basically said that the God of the Hebrews, right, of those of us of this spirituality, the being Hebrews of that spirituality, have, right, met with us, and now we need to go sacrifice and meet with him, right? Now, here in verse 25, the first compromise refused. Paro, oh, the great house, called for Moshe and Aharon and said, go ye and sacrifice to your Elohim in the land. Now, this is only because of, according to the narrative, that swarm, right, that swarm uh, of flies in, in verse 24 is italicized, of flies is italicized. So some sort of swarm of flying like creatures. You can see this right here in this verse. You see where flies is italicized? So that's not there in the Hebrew. That's why it doesn't have a Strong's word, right? But Pharaoh called for Moshe and Aharon and said, right? Remember, at this point from chapter 7, the previous chapter, Moses, Moshe is a nature, is a nature to Paro, to the great house. He's a God in that sense, an Elohim. And Aharon is his prophet. So what about the influence there? 
it's obvious that because they are in this situation and looking at it in a realismism situation, that now Yahweh says to Moses, you're going to be a God, a, a nature in a comedic sense, a net or a nature or Elohim, right? When you go, you represent yourself as Elohim to him. You've been talking about the Elohim, but now I have made you an Elohim to him and your brother, Mo, your brother Aaron is going to be your mouth piece. So this kind of gives us an idea that even back then, ones who would be either impersonating or acting on behalf as the, as the God, the God as the God, would have somebody who would speak for them in this, in this order. Now we get to this chapter here where Paro is like, you know, the great house, the nobility, all the rest of them. That's why we show this right here, just so you can see the structure of things. And we say from a Hebrew sense, the Paro, there's the vizier of Lower Egypt, Upper Egypt, the viceroy of Kush, and then we have the people level right there. You can see this kind of an order, right? This order right there. And where are the Hebrews? The Hebrews are like at the bottom, and by this time, they're almost below the bottom, right? So you see farmers and laborers. Before that time, they were all of these, right? And Yosef was, was second to Paro, right? But he was more like a vizier. My, you know, in the position of like a priest, a high priest. So I'm saying that that Joseph, Yawasaf, Zafnat, Paanki, Paank, Paank, right, that he served as a priest and he set legislation for Egypt and the whole famine time, according to the narrative, that did benefit the Bene Yisrael, right, the children of Israel and other Hebrews, right those who may be in of a similar spirituality from the view of the Kemetiu, right, before the Hyksos expulsion. But the Hebrews and the Israelites are left behind after that, right? Because this is now leading up to this. This puts the whole context of Exodus into perspective. But lest we, right, lest we should uh, digress, right? So this paro here, right, Right, this Pharaoh here, and we're talking about Tutmos the third, and we're gonna put that there. I know people are gonna scoff in the market, but hopefully, stay tuned, stay tuned. He says right here, he says, "Go ye sacrifice to your Elohim, your nature in the land." You see the word "in the land," in the land. This is the compromise proposed by the Peraa, the Great House, the administration of Mitzrayim, are to be urged. Right, this is like what they urge upon faithful ones, you know, even Christians in that context, even today. First, the first says, in effect, be a Christian or be a believer in Yeshua, Yahusha, or, you know, and, and, and go ahead, do your religious thing, if you will, if that's what you're going to do. But don't be a narrow one. Don't be a narrow one. Remember, it says, let us go. The, the demand was, let us go three days, the sacrifice, and we'll come back, blah, 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 right? But they're like, no, 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 no. Here's what you do. Be be a Hebrew, if you will, right? Be a Christian, if you will, but not in a narrow one. Stay. See the thing when he says in the land, he's saying stay in Mitzrayim. They were saying, let us go into the desert. Let us go into the desert for three days, right? And once you accept this compromise, and I submit to you today that the lost sheep, the Beta Israel black people here in so-called America is about 60 years ago, Right, accepted the compromise, civil rights, affirmative. We accepted the compromise, right? And in that compromise, it ends in world conformity, world pleasing, seeking the world's money, right, for our soul and for God, right? In other words, we got we got so worldly, right, and it broke down the black community, right? Before that, blacks were talking about coming out by having our own at least, even in America. What about 40 acres and a mule? What about that? It was the economics that was the real part that took a second place in the compromise. They even compromised how they put it forward, right? They first put forward a little social thing and then said, we could talk about the money later on. And as soon as King started talking about the money later on, they shot him. All right. Well, he also was talking against the war and everything like that. Right. There was war then. And there was also war here in this narrative here. Now, Moses says to him something very important. Hopefully we'll pick up on this later on. But this is one of the main points. Right? And Moses said, it is not meat. He didn't say meat like meat. Coon, 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 coon. 
right? It's not meat, coon. Coon means to be firm, to stab. So when we say coon today, people think we're talking about coons and possums because you don't know no Hebrew, but, but getting that gift of the Holy Spirit, coon means to be prepared, means to be meat, to be proper, right? It's not proper. The sense right here, it is not confirm. It's not a firm thing. It's not a proper thing to do. It's not right in that sense. It's not coon, right? Low coon. It's not right so to do. So Moshe says, nah, 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 nah. It's not, remember, Moses is the God, according to Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. He's a God to Paro. He's not a God to us. We know he's a God to Paro. Right? You know what I mean? But he's not a God to us as the Hebrews, but we understand him being a God now to Paro and Aharon being his prophet. But Aaron doesn't even speak these words. Moses now just responds directly. Right? The one who is the God on behalf of the Hebrew God directly responds to the great house, the Sutan Bit. Right? It is not proper so to do. But now notice what's being said. For we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Mitzrayim, of the Tawians, Smai Tawians, of the Kamitiu, La Yahuwah. Notice what he says. He says, this is not right to do for us to stay in the land and not go for the three days, but do our, our so-called spirituality, our religious uh, rites and rituals, you know, really just rituals. If we do what is, so this shows even in Egypt, they were talking about sacrifice. Why? Because every firstborn male Right of of Israel, like in many other nations, had that right, that opportunity, right, to be like almost like a ruler and priest of his household and perhaps of his clan, if he has a clan. So Moses says, nah, nah, nah. We're not gonna stay here and do because we stay here, we will sacrifice the abomination. Remember how it says that every shepherd was an abomination? Right? Because he moved from ram worship right, to the oxen worship. You have to understand the different worship. Some say it has to do with the stars and the progression, uh, procession of equinoxes. But basically what Moses is saying that if we do, if, if we do that, we will be sacrificing what the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians regard as an abomination. We will be having to kill a, a, a goat. They don't want that. We'll have to kill a lamb. They don't want that. You know, we're going to have to kill these ones that, that many of the Mitzrayim, the Smaitawian, saw as kind of placeholders or in relation with their netras, the netaru, if we do that here. That's why he says, we shall. Right? He said, this is not right, because if we do this, this is say, we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians, that which they don't like, that which they don't do in their religious rites. Like people say, hey, in America, you can have your own religion. You can worship what you want to worship. Right? So the, so the Rastaman bun a split before it became legal. You know, bun the chalice and went to jail and was in prison for it, or grow locks. And he said, ah, oh, before it become popular, you, you get what I'm saying? Right? A lot of people suffer to do a lot of the things that today we might practice some things and we take it for granted because people before, this is the context of what's going on. So he says that what we're going to do, he tells Paro, oh, the great house, the, the king and everybody else, his royals, nobles, priestly people and all that, we will sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians, la Yahuwah, Eloheinu, to he who be who he be, our Elohim, our nature, the nature of nature, lo, Shall we sacrifice, now he asks a question, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians? Now, if you say, what is the abomination of the Egyptians? Remember in Bereshith, it says that the shepherd was regarded, you know, the, the shepherd wasn't highly regarded because they had moved, you know, like, remember the Amen, Amen Ra, and there was different if you study ancient Egypt, you'll, you'll figure this out, right? But they said, Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Mitzrayim before their eyes? So so, so Pharaoh was saying, Potter, oh, oh, slick Willie was saying, why don't you just sacrifice right here? Don't go nowhere. You know, like if I'm in your house and say you're a vegan or vegetarian and Maybe I'm vegan too, but at this time, you know, we're going we're gonna to have some lamb chop. It's Pesach, it's Passover. Just, let's just say that is what we're doing, right? And in your house, you may understand my faith, my belief, so forth and so on. But in your pots, your pans, and your family, you know, like, 
that would be considered abomination, right? You know what I mean? But I said, okay, let me go just outside. You know, let me go, go, go. go. I'll be back. I'm in your house, right? I'm gonna go and I'm gonna come back. He said, no, 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 no. Why don't you just, uh, just you know, just do, do, do what you gotta do here, right? And I'm saying, no, <laughs> that's not gonna be right. If if I do that, your whole family gonna beat me up because they're all vegan and and they don't they don't be cooking no meat or burning no lamb or eating no lamb and we're gonna be sitting down burning lamb chops in the house. This is the context of it, right? He says, "Look, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Mitzrayim before their eyes, and will they not stone us? Will they not stone us?" So, see the point here. That a lot of people, when they try to consider the reality or maybe to some the unreality, whatever, you know, of this narrative, they don't put this into context, right? That whatever the practice of the Hebrews were may have been similar in some ways to the Egyptians, but even then, what they will do is totally different. Right, then what the Mitzrayim were doing with their 42 different denominations, ancient Egypt with their 42 at least different denominations, whatever the Hebrews are going to do, that's going to be a uh uh. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like they, like people accept all kind of religion, they accept the church of Satan, you know, and everything. But we say, well, we Rastafari, we, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> You know, we laugh today, but think about, you know, people's lives messed up because they had a little bit of marijuana. Now it's so-called legal. Now it's medicinal. Oh, my gosh. Verse 27. What does what does he affirm here? Does to seal this point? He says, we will go three days journey into the wilderness. He, he goes back to what the first demand was. We will go three days journey. Did they say we're going to exit, we're going to leave you, and we're going to go and make our own nation and connect? Was that any of what was said at this time? No, it wasn't, right? Because Yahuwah told Moshe, this is, the, this is what you should do. He's not going to let you go, but you got to go through, go through the motions here. We will go th three days journey in the wilderness, the mead bar, the desert, and sacrifice La Yahuwah to Jehovah Eloheinu as he shall command us. Because Paro, Pharaoh was thinking he getting a little slick here. He was like, yeah, 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 you can just do this right here. You know, like, like I give you, you know, I give you the permission. You can just do this if you want to do this. And so forth and so on, right? And then, then um, you know, Paro, you know, he said, I will let you go. Now, now, now look at that. Pharaoh now is saying that he's going to, he's going to, Right, right. He's saying that he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna let them go in the next verse. Right, verse twenty-eight. I will let you go that you may sacrifice to Yahweh your Elohim in the wilderness, Elohekem Bamidbar. Only y'all shall not go very far. <laughs> what, what's going on here? You're not gonna go very far. You're not gonna go far, are you? And treat for me. Right. And treat for me. So we're going to just seal it up right there, you know, for right now, right here. Was there influence? Well, of course. But of course, there was, um, you know, influence. But the majority of what we have right in the fuller sense of the um, Levitical is a reaction to certain cometicism that was was lotob, lotob, lotowab, that was not good for this people who were to be a a people of the, you know, a people of a, a priesthood, you know, a kingdom of a priesthood and a set apart nation to him, a particular covenant people to him. So anyway, right here, 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 the shepherd, remember I'm talking about the shepherd is an abomination, right? So this also helps us to get the exact time or a more precise time period of when these events in 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 in, in the Torah might likely or could have possibly might occurred. And here we'll just do this right here. The men are are shepherds. This is the last I promise you right here, just to seal up. Genesis forty six and thirty two. And the men are shepherds, for their trade have been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. This is when they spoke to Safnat Pa'ank, Pa'anki, to, to Joseph. That was his name. Ank is right there if you know the Hebrew and the commit to you. Here's the verse right here. Verse 40, verse um, 34, two verses later, Genesis 46, 34. 
that y'all shall say, this is what I think Joseph was telling them, here's how you can go about it. He tells them specifically, say you are cow herds, not shepherds. He keeps telling them, say you are cow herds, not shepherds. But when the sons did go before Parao in a time of Yawasaf, Joseph, they actually said the opposite. You know, it's like, it just tells us that this is our people. Sometimes we we told to do this, but then we wound up doing that. And then we see the consequence. That y'all shall say, thy servants trade have been in cattle from our youth even until now both we and our fathers that y'all may dwell in the land of Goshen here it goes for every shepherd is an abomination to the Mitzrayim now is there historical evidence where the shepherd or something of the shepherd type this is where the Hexos Hekshaus my shepherd kings for every shepherd is an abomination to the Egyptians. So now this now even helps to connect better right, with what we have in Exodus during that period of the compromise, what Pharaoh said to, you know, just do it right here. And he says, shall we sacrifice, you know, the abomination of the Egyptians? And then in the book before, Moshe's first book, we get to find out that Joseph, Tzafnat Pa'ank, was telling his brothers that the shepherd right, is an abomination to the Smaitawians or to the Mitzrayim, the Egyptians of that particular time and period. Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom. So did the Levitical priesthood come out of Egypt? Answer, no. Was there influence with Egypt or Mitzrayim, Kemet? Yes, of course. Some of it good and may be even beautiful, right? Some good and beautiful, the fact that Israel grew and all of that, right? But some of it bad and ugly, for example, the molten calf, where Israel broke the covenant before it was renewed. Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom. This is Ras Yad and right here, 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 Rasafari Jews, and I and I approve of this message. Shalom, Chabarim, Shalom.